الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا موسى بن جعفر يا باب الحوائج يا ابن رسول الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين ينفقون في السراء والضراء والكاظمين الغيظ والكاظمين الغيظ والعافين عن الناس والله يحب المحسنين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد I would like to begin by giving you all my condolences for the martyrdom anniversary of the seventh Imam of Ahl al-Bayt al-Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim alayhi salam who, whose martyrdom took place on the 25th of the month of Rajab in the year 183 after the Hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This great Imam who has several titles and names and he was a known scholar during his time within the Muslim world as a whole and specifically within the school of the Ahlul Bayt, he is known as the seventh Imam of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. And the Imam, he superseded everyone during his time through his knowledge, through his ibadah, through his worship, through his closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal. And he was the Imam who came after Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Of course, the life of every Imam needs to be analyzed. We, the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt, we need to know our Imams. Many of us, we are very familiar with politicians, with actors, with athletes, but we don't know much about the Imams who we follow and the Imams who we take our faith and religion from them. This is a very important point that we all must know because in the grave, the first night in the grave, we will be interrogated. Every single one of us will be subject to interrogation and several things we will be asked. Who is your Lord? Where is your Kaaba? What is your holy book? Who is your prophet? Which direction is your Qibla? And who is your Imam? Being familiar with our Imams, this is a duty upon every single one of us. The hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that is unanimously accepted by all Muslims. He says, مَنْ مَاتَ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ إِمَامَ زَمَانِهِ مَاتَ مِيتَةً جَاهِلِيَّةً The one who dies and is not familiar with the Imam of his time, 
This person dies the death of the pagans. This person dies as if he was not familiar with the religion of Islam. Because the Imam is the one who connects us with Rasulullah. And Rasulullah is the one who connects us with Allah. So therefore we have to be able to have that close bond. And we are only able to achieve that through the Imams, the rightful Imams that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for to be leaders of humanity and leaders of Muslims. And the hadith, the famous hadith that is narrated in Bukhari and in many Sunni sources, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says that the Imams after me, they are 12 and they are all from Quraysh. In another hadith, they are from the children of Fatima. So today, Muslims need to ask themselves, who are these 12 that Rasulullah spoke about? Who are these 12 individuals that are considered to be Imams that Rasulullah foretold about? Today, Muslims, they, you ask them who were the rightful guided Imams, leaders, they tell you four. They'll tell you Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman, then Ali ibn Abi Talib. These are the Khulafa al Rashidun. You tell them, but the hadith that is narrated in Bukhari says 12. They stop at four. How can you stop at four when the hadith of Rasulullah says 12? So we need to reanalyze our beliefs and we need to know who are these 12. One of those 12, my dear brothers and sisters, is one of the great Imams of the Ahlul Bayt and that is Al-Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam, Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam. Of course, the Imamah of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far lasted for 35 years after the death of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he came to the official Imam came to him where he was chosen by Allah Azza wa Jal. However, this great Imam, a great portion of his Imam was spent while he was in prison. Can you believe it? An Imam who is like a light of guidance, who is radiating with light and knowledge the Khalifa during his time, the Caliph during his time, he goes and he places him in the dungeons. He goes and he places him in the prisons where the Imam, the grandson of Rasulullah, dies in the dungeons of Baghdad, in the dungeons of Harun. And it was during the time, specifically during the time of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, that the Muslim Ummah was during its so-called golden age. Today we hear Muslim scholars, we always talk about the golden age that Muslims went through. One of that time was the time of Harun. Harun al-Rashid, they call him Harun the wise man. But how could a man be wise? How could a man be called wise when he places the grandson of Rasulullah in the dungeons? Placing a grandson of Rasulullah who he knew that that man is an imam, a imam chosen by Allah Azza wa Jal. However, you see that the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, despite the fact that society turned against them, despite the fact that they were lonely at times, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, one hadith says 14 years he spent in the dungeons. Another hadith says a little bit less. This great Imam, he was able to keep his faith. He was able to lead the Ummah, even while he was in the dungeons. He was able to guide people while he was imprisoned. This is the Imam that was chosen by Allah Azza wa Jal. Of course, before going into the details about the history of the life of the Imam and what lessons we can learn from the Imam, let's talk a little bit about the names of the Imam. One of the names that Imam Musa ibn Ja'far is known by is Imam al kadhim And this was a name given to him by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Because Rasulullah, he named all of the Imams and he gave them the titles. What does al kadhim mean? al kadhim means the one who is able to control his feelings and anger. At a time when you are able to take revenge, at a time when you are able to take revenge of those who have abused you, you control yourself. This, is, this requires strength. This requires power to be able to control yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses this quality in the Qur'an 
when referring to the mu'mineen, when referring to the believers, Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Those who give charity in times of secret and in times of public. And this is why it's very recommended to give charity in two ways. One is in public, in front of people. Why? So that you encourage people to give. So that you encourage people to donate. And second, في الضراء, في الضراء Second is in private. Why in private? To discipline yourself. Some of us, we want to give in public so that other people say, MashaAllah, look at this person. He's donating. She's donating. But how many of us are actually be willing to give charity where no one knows about it? No one knows about it. No one talks about it. Only a mu'min, only a believer will do so because they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the witness. They know that Allah is watching. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ In times of good and in times of difficulties. In times when you're good, when you're able to give, then there's nothing wrong with giving. When in times that you're going through difficulty, you don't have, you also give. That is also a sign of a believer, of a mu'min. And then Allah says, And the ones who control their ghayd, the ones who control their anger, الناس, and those who forgive others who have done wrong to them, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. And Allah loves those who do ihsan. And this was one of the qualities of the Imam alayhi salam. Where sometimes he would be able to take revenge, he would be able to take his haq and his right, but he wouldn't do so. Why? Because he controls himself, because, because he controls his anger. It is said that one day the Imam alayhi salam, he had a servant. He had a servant who was pouring water for him while the Imam was doing something. So that servant, he injured the Imam. He had a jug of water. He injured the Imam alayhi salam, where the Imam started bleeding. And this is a servant. What would we do? What would we do if someone who works for us, someone who's beneath us, does something bad and ends up injuring us? We would get angry. We wouldn't be able to control ourselves. The Imam alayhi salam, he controlled himself. Because that man, he says, that man he began to say, al So the Imam alayhi salam, he says, لَقَدْ كَظَمْتُ غَيْظِي I controlled my anger. And then that man says, وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ And those who forgive others. The Imam, he says, لَقَدْ عَفَوْتُ عَنْكِ And then he says, وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ So then the Imam alayhi salam, then he says, you are free in the way of Allah. Go and you are not going to be held accountable for anything. This is the Imam. This is the akhlaq of these great Imams. This was one name of the Imam, Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam. Another name for Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam is Bab al-Hawa'ij. And this is a name that the Imam alayhi salam was known for. Bab al-Hawa'ij. What does Bab al-Hawa'ij mean? Bab al-Hawa'ij means he is the door of anyone who is in need. Anytime anyone is in need, they go to him. They would ask him and they would see that their needs are satisfied. Today, my dear brothers and sisters, we claim to be the followers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. Our Imam is Babu al-Hawa'ij. How many of us have become Babu al-Hawa'ij for other people? How many of us have solved the needs of other people? If someone comes and asks me, do I help this person? Or do I just cry for Babu al-Hawa'ij and, and I don't change my life? When we remember these Imams, we have to try to take lessons from the lives of these Imams. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was Bab al Hawa'ij for everyone. Not only the people who were close by, not only the relatives, not only people who were in need. It is said that the Imam alayhi salam, he had bags of gold and silver. And anyone who would come to him, he would give them those bags that would take that person out of poverty. So say for example, someone's poor, the Imam alayhi salam gives him where this person is not poor anymore. This person, that's it. Their whole life changes. Now sometimes if someone comes and asks us, 
we come and we take a, a few dollars out of our pocket and we give a person a few dollars so that this person could go buy a meal or a sandwich. The Imams السلام, when they would give, they would give in a way where people would not be poor anymore. This is a real Bab al Hawa'ij. And this quality was something that the Imam was known by not only amongst the Shias but amongst everyone during their time. Al Imam al Shafi'i. Al Imam al Shafi'i is one of the four Imams of the Sunni schools of thought. There are four major schools of thought. One of them is al Shafi'i. He says about Al Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, about the grave of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Not just the Imam himself, but the grave. Meaning that even after the death of the Imam, people would go to the grave and they would see that he is Bab al Hawa'ij. They would go next to the grave of the Imam, ask Allah for their hajat, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give them. Al Imam al Shafi'i, he says, Qabr Musa ibn Ja'far, tiryaqun mujarrab li ijabat al dua. He says the grave of Musa ibn Ja'far is a tiryaqun mujarrab. It's basically a medicine that has been practiced many times for ijabat al-du'a, for the answer of the du'a. This is a man who is a leader of a Sunni school of thought. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i, he says this about Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam. Now imagine we who we have the love of the Ahlul Bayt in our hearts, if we go to his grave, do you think that he will leave us and he will not answer us? Of course not. These Imams, they are beacons of light during their life and after their death. Go to their grave. There's nothing wrong with going and visiting the graves of the Imams, of the awliya. In fact, hadith say, says that even if you go to the grave of your parents, if they were mu'mineen, if they were good individuals, and you ask Allah by the rights of your parents, Allah will answer your du'as. So if Allah accepts your du'a by the grave of your parents, He won't accept your du'a by the grave of the Imams, by the grave of Rasulullah. And Allah says this about Rasulullah, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولِ لَوَجَدُوا اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا If you go to Rasulullah and you ask Allah to forgive you next to Rasulullah, and Rasulullah asks Allah to forgive you, you will see that Allah will forgive. Similarly, Allah will forgive and accept your dua next to the grave of the great Imams of the Ahlul Bayt alayhumussalam. Now, this great Imam, he lived during very turbulent times. You know, we always say that during the life of Imam al-Baqir and during the life of Imam al-Kadhim, there was, excuse me, during the life of Imam al-Baqir and during the life of Imam al-Sadiq, there was a window of opportunity for the followers of the Ahlul Bayt and the Ahlul Bayt to spread the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. And this started because of the fall of the, the Umawi government and the rise of the Abbasi government. So during that era, the tyrants who were in power, they did not have very strong authority to control the Imams. So therefore the Imams, Imam al-Baqir, during his time, Bani Umayya was falling. So he began the school of Ahl al-Bayt. He began teaching people. He had the freedom. During the time of Imam al-Sadiq, the Bani Umayya, Umayya government fell and a new government came to power. But they, weren't, they didn't have firm control of power. Towards the end of the life of Imam al-Sadiq, the Abbasi government under the authority of al-Mansur, they took very strong hold of power. They were ruling with an iron fist where it became just as bad as it was during the Umawi time. Some people, they say these are the Abbasis, the children of Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet. They were much more lenient with the Ahlul Bayt. No, in fact, they weren't. They were worse in, at su certain times than Bani Umayyah themselves. And even though they were close in kin to Bani Hashim, so during that time, during the last days of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, there were so many spies around the house of the Imam. And the Imam was poisoned by Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi. And Mansur al-Dawaniqi, he said, he had a person working for him in Medina. He tells him, go and see whoever Ja'far al-Sadiq had appointed as the next Imam after him and kill that person right away. 
So there was a tactic to remove anyone who has that connection with Allah and kill anyone who has that connection with Allah. But Imam As-Sadiq alayhi salam, he had a different tactic. He made a public will and a private will. In the private will, he told the people that, he told people around him that Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam is the Imam after him. And people, the close people, they began to follow Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. However, there were others in, in the, the public will that the Imam made the Imam alayhi salam, he appointed five people to be the leaders after him. He appointed five to be the leaders after him. One of them was Al-Mansur himself, the one who poisoned the Imam. Another one was the governor of Medina, Muhammad ibn Sulaiman. A third is Abdullah al-Aftah, one of the sons of the Imam. And one was the wife of the Imam, Hamidah al-Barbariyah. And the fifth was Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam. So now, Mansur, he comes and he says, go and kill whoever he gave his wasiyah to, whoever is the leader after him. They go and they look at the wasiyah, they see the name of Mansur is in there. And the name of the governor of Medina is in there. So the Imam Sadiq alayhi salam managed to protect the life of the next Imam after him. But this, it caused a dilemma for some of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. It caused a dilemma for some of them because it was during that time that many people did not know who their Imams were. And it was during that time that you see the Ismaili sect emerged. The Ismaili sect emerged because they believed that the Imam should be the oldest from the son of the Imam before him. But Ismail, he was the son of Imam Al Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Ismail died during the life of Imam Sadiq. During the life of the Imam, he passed away. And Imam Sadiq, he carried him to his grave. And on his way, when he carried him to the grave, he tells them, listen, this is my son Ismail, he died. Don't come and follow him after me. He buried him. He went in the grave and he placed his son Ismail in the grave. And he tells them, Ismail died. Don't follow him after me. Then later on, after the death of Imam Sadiq, there were people that came out and they called themselves the Ismailis. They came and they said, Ismail came back to life and we began to follow him. There was another group that emerged. Ismail was the oldest, the son of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. There was another son who was named Abdullah al-Aftah. Abdullah al-Aftah, he was the second in line. Aftah means he had flat foot. His feet were flat. There was a problem with him. And one of our beliefs, one of our aqaid, is that the Imam السلام, has to be complete physically and mentally. There should be no, uh, no disability in the Imam. السلام. Some people, they came, they said, okay, he's the next in line, Abdullah al Aftah. We're going to follow Abdullah al Aftah. And there were some people that came and they started following Abdullah. And there you have another sect that emerged referred to as the Fatahi sect. Al-Fatahi sect, they started following Abdullah al-Aftah. There's a beautiful hadith that is narrated in Usul al-Kafi, which is narrated by, um, it's narrated by uh, two, one of the companions of the Imam alayhi salam, by the name of Hisham ibn Salim, he says, I, Hisham, and another companion by the name of Mu'min al-Taq. He says, we came from Kufa to Medina, and we don't know who our Imam is. And this is the greatest calamity that could fall upon a person when they don't know who their Imam is. When, people, when a person does not know who his Imam is, that is a calamity upon that person. Every single one of us has an Imam. And that every time there's an Imam. So this man, he says, I went to Medina and I saw Abdullah al Aftah. He's sitting in the house and there are people following him. And people are saying, Abdullah is the next Imam after Imam Ja'far al Sadiq. So he says, We went and we asked him a question about zakat. We asked him a difficult question about the zakat we saw that he answered us a very different answer. And then we, tell, we, tell, we ask him, what do the murja'ah, another sect, what do they say about this? He says, wallah, I don't know what the murja'ah say about this. 
So then this man, Hisham ibn Salim and Mu'min al-Taq, they are crying and they say they're walking in the alleys of Medina, not knowing who their imam is. And they feel like they are lost sheep where there are wolves around them. This is a, hadith, a beautiful hadith in Al-Kafi. He says, after we, are, we were walking, then we saw a man, an old man, he called us. He says, follow me this way. So Hisham, he tells Mu'min, At-Taq, he tells him, go. These are the spies of Al-Mansur and my head is going to be chopped off. My head is going to be chopped off because now they've associated us with Ja'far al-Sadiq. And we're looking for an imam after Ja'far al-Sadiq. So he tells Mu'min al-Taq, you go, let me go. If someone's going to fall, let me at least, let this happen to me. He says, I went. That man, he began to guide me through the alleys until he took me to the house of Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam. So then he says, we saw al-Imam alayhi salam, Musa ibn Ja'far sitting. And he told us, he says, leave the waqifah, leave the murja'ah, leave the khawarij. فَإِلَيَّ إِلَيَّ إِلَيَّ Come to me, I am the one who has the knowledge. I am the one who has that God-given knowledge. So he says, we went. We went to him and we told him, what is the matter with Abdullah al-Aftah? What is the matter with Abdullah? Is he really the Imam? He says, Musa ibn Ja'far told us, Abdullah yuridu an la Allah. Abdullah wants Allah to, be not, to not be worshipped. Anyone who comes and assumes the position of imama, other than the rightful imam, is a person who's doing great harm to himself and to others. So then they asked him, are you the imam? The imam salam was in a state of taqiyah. So he says, ask other than that. And then they asked him, do you have an imam right now? He tells them, I don't have an imam. So then they realized that he was the imam. Then they go and he, they tell him, can we tell people about this? He tells them, if you go out publicly, then it will be my neck. Look at the Imam alayhi salam. If he declares that he is the rightful Imam, the government will execute him, will kill him. So then he tells them, go in private amongst the Shi'as, amongst those who you know, and tell them about our matter. This is the Imam alayhi salam. But of course, Harun... Harun, he knew exactly that the Imam السلام, was the rightful leader. One day, Ma'moon, Ma'moon is the son of Harun. He says, one day I was with my father in Medina. My father Harun came to perform the Hajj and people were coming to visit him from Bani Hashim. They were coming to visit him and anyone who visits him, he would give them a bag of gold or silver and people were forced to come and visit him. So he says, I saw my father, he wasn't treating people all, you know, he wasn't giving anyone special treatment. Until one second, I saw a man, a pious man, he walked into the room, and I saw my father, he got up from the throne, from his seat, and he comes to this man, and he brings him, and he places him in his seat, and he shows the utmost respect to this man. So then, he says, after my father left, I told my father, Oh father, who is this man that you showed so much respect to? He tells me, Ma'moon says, that his father told him, this is Musa ibn Ja'far, this is the man who deserves to be sitting in the Khilafah. This is the real Khalifa of Rasulullah. This is the man who has all of the knowledge of Rasulullah. So then al Ma'moon he says, I told my father, then, O oh Father, if you know he is the rightful Imam, if you know he has the knowledge, then why don't you give him the power? Why don't you give him the authority? He says, my father told me, O oh my dear son, even if you, my son, fight with me over power, I will take your head off. This is what power does to certain people. This is what power does to people where they're willing to, he's willing to kill his own son and... He poisoned the Imam alayhi salam. He poisoned Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam. Of course, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was placed in prison several times. But the last time was during the time of Harun. And what was the reason for that? 
The reason for that was that Harun, he had an argument with the Imam. And the Imam السلام, was able to defeat him, was able to show him the truth. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far السلام, he's in Masjid al-Nabi. He's in the masjid of his grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Harun comes to perform the hajj. So he visits Medina from Baghdad. So he stands in front of the grave of Rasulullah Harun and he says, Assalamu alayka ya ibn al-Am. Peace be upon you, O cousin, O Rasulullah. So Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam, he says, Assalamu alayka ya abatahu ya Rasulullah. Assalamu alayka ya jaddah ya Rasulullah. Peace be upon you, O father, O Rasulullah. Peace be upon you, O grandfather, O Rasulullah. Of course, at that time, Harun felt, felt, you know, embarrassed that there is someone who is closer to the Prophet than him. So then he calls the Imam and he tells him, how do you, you and your fathers declare that Hassan and Hussein are the children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. When Hassan and Hussein, they are, when Hassan and Hussein, they are the children of Rasulullah through the mother. They are the children of Rasulullah through Fatima. And they are actually the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They're not the children of Rasulullah. They're the children of Ali, who is the son of Abu Talib. And we, the Abbasis, Harun says this, we, the children of Abbas, we go back to Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet. You go back to Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet. So what's the difference between you and us? And you come and you say, we are the children of Hassan and Hussein, and Hassan and Hussein are the children of Rasulullah. So the Imam alayhi salam, he recited two verses of the Quran to prove that Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein are the children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He tells him, first he recites Surah Ayat al-Mubahala, فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ Allah says in the event of Mubahala, Rasulullah called who? نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ Call our children and you bring your children. Our women and your women and ourselves and yourselves. Who did Rasulullah bring from the children? Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein. So the Imam alayhi salam, he tells Harun, أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ In this verse were Hassan and Hussein. So how could you say that Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein are not the children of Rasulullah when the Quran says, أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ And then he recited another verse. He recited a verse, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ وَأَيُّوبَ And the verse continues, it says, وَعِيسَى Allah is speaking about the children of Ibrahim. The children of Ibrahim, Dawood, Sulaiman, Ayyub. They are the children of Ibrahim. And then the Quran says, Isa is the son of Ibrahim. How could Isa be the son of Ibrahim when he doesn't have a father? This means that the relationship is not always just through the father. So Imam Al-Kadhim, he tells him, How is Isa the son of Ibrahim? Harun says, through his mother, Maryam. And then the Imam alayhi salam, he tells him how far was the distance between Maryam and Ibrahim? How many fathers were there? Harun says, many fathers. So then he tells him, so Allah says that Isa is from the children of Ibrahim. And you don't want to accept that Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein are the children of Rasulullah when there was only one person between them and Rasulullah. And that was Fatima alayhi salam. So Harun felt that he was defeated in the argument. And that was the reason, historians say, that was the reason that Harun sent the Imam in prison. Because of this simple reason. Because he couldn't tolerate seeing an Imam who was strong, an Imam who was able to answer him, an Imam who was able to stand against the, the you know, misconceptions of the time. This was the Imam alayhi salam. Harun, of course, publicly, he would try to make it seem like he was very close to the Imam. So one day, Harun, as soon as he took power, he tells Imam al-Kadhim, he tells him, I'm going to give you back Fadak. 
fadak that was taken away from Fatima to Zahra, I'm going to give it back to you. So the Imam alayhi salam, he tells him, you're not going to be able to give us back fadak. He tells him why. So the Imam alayhi salam, he writes a letter, he tells him because the borders of fadak are all the way from North Africa to Asia. And the, he basically gives him the map of the Muslim empire at that time. He tells him that is fadak. That is what fadak symbolizes. Fadak is not just a piece of land. Fadak symbolizes the whole khilafah. And this is why Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, she stood and she stood to argue with the, with the establishment at that time over Fadak. She was not arguing over a piece of land. She was arguing over the khilafah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So this was what happened with the Imam alayhi salam. Of course, the Imam, as we mentioned, he was taken to prison several times. Several times. There were several caliphs that came. Al-Hadi, Al-Mahdi, and then finally Harun. It is said that when the Imam alayhi salam, he was taken to the dungeons of Harun, and when he was placed in the prison, what did the Imam alayhi salam say? The Imam alayhi salam, he made a dua. He says, Allahumma innaka ta'lam inni kuntu as'aluka an tufarrighani li'ibadatik. Allahumma falaqad fa'alt falaka alhamdu ala thalik. Who out of us would thank Allah if someone places us in prison? The Imam alayhi salam, he was taken to the prison. He says, oh Allah, you know, only you know that I would ask you, I would always do dua. That, oh Allah, allow me, give me the free time where no distractions are in my way, where I could worship you, where I could worship you as much as I want. And now that you have given me that opportunity, thank you for that, oh Allah. This was the Imam alayhi salam. One of the, one of the men, he's Al-Fadl bin Yahya, he says, Al-Fadl bin Rabi' one of the prisons that the Imam was sent to, First, he was sent to the prison of Isa ibn Ja'far in Basra. And Harun tells Isa ibn Ja'far to torture the Imam. Isa ibn Ja'far, he says, I don't want to torture the Imam. So he takes him out and he places him in the dungeons in the prison of Al-Fadl ibn Rabi'ah. Al-Fadl ibn Rabi'ah, he, one day Harun comes to visit him. He wants to see what is the Imam doing in the dungeons of Al-Fadl ibn Rabi'ah. So he sees at night he comes, Al-Fadl ibn Rabi' he takes Harun on the roof of the house. And the house, it had a garden in the middle of the house where from the roof you could see inside. So he says, I took Harun. Al-Fadl ibn Rabi' he says, I took Harun and I showed him a piece of cloth that was fallen in the middle of the garden, in the middle of the yard. He tells him, what is that? So Harun says, this is a piece of cloth that's on the ground. Al-Fadl ibn al Rabi' he tells him, this is not a piece of cloth. This is Musa ibn Ja'far in the state of sujood. This is Musa ibn Ja'far in the state of sujood. Do you know that from dawn until sunset, he is in the state of sujood. He lifts his head only during the time of the prayer. And the whole time he is fasting, he's not eating. This is the Imam alayhi salam. Then they take him to another prison, Al-Fadl ibn Yahya. Al-Fadl ibn Yahya, he shows respect to the Imam. So Harun, he tells him, take them out. And they take him to the final prison that the Imam was in. And that was a prison by the name of a man. By, his name is As-Sindi ibn Shahik. This man had, was very cruel towards the Imam where they say that that dungeon that the Imam alayhi salam was placed in was a hole in the ground. A hole in the ground which the Imam alayhi salam would not be able to distinguish between day and night time. And they would have methods of trying to torture the Imam and harass the Imam. One day in one of those prisons that he was in, they send a prostitute for the Imam. Imagine, this is Waliyullah al-A'zam. This is the great hujja of Allah. They send a prostitute to him to see if the imam is going to do anything wrong. 
So the man who had sent in that prostitute, he says, I sent her in. The imam was in the state of sujood the whole time. He says, I came back, I see the imam is in the state of sujood, and that lady is just sitting there. He says, I came back an another time, and I see that he's in the state of sujood, and that lady is just sitting there. He says, another time I come, and I see the imam is in the state of sujood, and the lady is also in a state of sujood behind him. This is the imam alayhi salam. He is able to guide people. He is able to guide even when he is in the dungeons, even when he is in the prison. And this is how his final days were in the dungeons of As-Sindi ibn Shahik. This man, he poisons the Imam Harun. He sends the poison and the Imam alayhi salam, he is poisoned. But before that, that time in the, in the dungeons of As-Sindi ibn Shahik, the Imam was very bad, in a very bad situation. And one of the hadith says that in order to harass the imam, they would play music outside. They would play music outside the dungeon of the imam. The hadith says that once the imam saw that even his ibadah is being distracted, he asked Allah to take his life. He asked Allah to take his life because of the music that he's being exposed to. The imam alayhi salam he spent those final days worshipping and praying, fasting during the day and praying and fasting the whole, his whole time from the dungeon. He writes a letter to Harun while he's in the dungeon. He says in, in that letter, he says in his letter, he says, إِنَّهُ لَنْ يَنْقَضِي عَنْكَ يَوْمٌ He tells him, إِنَّهُ لَنْ يَنْقَضِي عَنْكَ يَوْمٌ مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ إِنَّهُ لَنْ يَنْقَضِي عَنِّي يَوْمٌ مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ إِلَّا أَنْقَضَى عَنْكَ يَوْمٌ مِنَ الرَّخَاءِ He tells Harun, every day of bala that passes by for me, this is a day of comfort that will end for you. حَتَّى نَفْضِي جَمِيعًا إِلَى يَوْمٍ لَيْسَ فِيهِ انْقِضَاء يَوْمَ يَخْسَرِ الْمُبْطِلُونَ Until we both go to a never-ending day and that is the day where we will have to stand in front of Allah. That is the day that every oppressor will be held accountable for every oppression that they have committed. The Imam alayhi salam, he was placed in that poison, in that prison. And while he was in the prison, there were shackles to his hand and his feet. They were so heavy that they broke the hands and the feet of the Imam alayhi salam. This is why in the ziyarah of the Imam, you say, وَصَلَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى مُوسَى بْنِ جَعْفَرِ الْمُعَذَّبِ فِي قَعْرِ السُّجُونِ وَظُلَمِ الْمَطَامِيرِ وَالسَّاقِ الْمَرْضُوضِ بِحَلَقِ الْقُيُودِ may, may the peace and blessings be upon Musa ibn Ja'far, who was tortured in the dungeons, and his bones, his legs were bent, the bones were broken because of the heavy metal that was wrapped around the hands and the legs of the Imam alayhi salam.